All right, welcome to our Sabbath service. And uh, we're going to start out by a blessing over the reading of the Torah. Baruch Adonai Hamvarak. Blessed is Adonai, the Blessed One. Baruch Adonai Hamvarak Leolam Vayed. Blessed is Adonai, the Blessed One, for all eternity. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Asher Bakr Banu Michol HaAmim. Venetin Lanu Et Torato. Baruch Adonai Noten HaTorah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has selected us from all peoples and gave us your Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. And as King David wrote in Psalm 119.18, let this be our prayer, open my eyes that I might behold wondrous things out of your Torah. Now the Torah doesn't just mean law, we're so used to that word meaning law, but it means instructions, God's instructions. And so a lot of people say, well, God's law has been done away with, but would we say his instructions? Has his instructions been done away with? Absolutely not. We have a misconception about what the Torah really is and what the Torah is really all about. Usually, uh, we would be going over the weekly Torah portion, but because we've just gone through this Passover week, uh, we don't have a particular Torah portion to go through, but we're reviewing the passages that are dealing with the exodus from Egypt and dealing with um, Passover itself. So I want to kind of go a little different direction on Passover. I want to talk about institutionalization. Now you're thinking, what does institutionalization have to do with Passover? Well, do you know what in, to be institutionalized means? It not, it, it not just means to be put in the funny farm. I mean, that's being institutionalized. But institutionalized means that your mentality is, is molded to the environment of the institution that you're in. I mean, you could be in the military and be institutionalized. You know, you have a routine, you get up at a certain time, you dress a certain way, you have inspection, you do drills, you eat at a certain time, all this, everything's regulated. Everything, you know, all these manners and customs and traditions and, and, and rules and regulations are just locked in your brain, locked in place, and you do them without even thinking. You do them as second nature. Prison is another example. People who have been institutionalized, they're in prison, and that's really the only way of life that they know. So it's no surprise that when uh, people are released from prison, they reoffend and get back in to the prison. Why? Because it's familiar. They're comfortable with it. Actually, being free scares them to death. They don't know how to handle freedom. They need to be told what to do and how to do it and when to do it, when to sleep, when to wake up, when to dress, when to eat, when to shower. They get three hots and a cot. Everything's prov provided for them. They don't have any worry that they're not going to eat. They have no worry that they're not going to have a place to sleep. That's all provided for them. It's a given. But when you've been released and you're free, you're like, okay, where am I going to live? How am I going to earn a living? Who's going to hire a convict? How am I going to get food? Where's my next meal coming from? How am I going get, to get a paycheck? How can I stay away from the temptations of stealing or doing drugs or whatever? So these people get institutionalized and they reoffend just so they can get back in. They may not want to commit a crime, but they know that if they do, that they're going to have that safety and familiarity of being institutionalized again. And there is a book by a, a guy, I can't remember his name, but the book is called Twice Pardon. And so um, he was put in prison a long time ago. But when he was released from prison, he talked about the institutionalized mentality. He talked about how hard it was for him to adjust to being a free man because he didn't even know how to use a microwave. He didn't know how to use a bathroom tap that had one lever. Can you imagine? I mean, to that, to us, that's nothing, right? You know, he didn't know how to use a touch dial phone. I mean, he was put in prison when you still use the rotary phone. He was put in prison before microwaves become a thing or was in every household. He was in prison when you had uh, the hot water tap and the cold water tap, not this lever that you turn left or right. He didn't know how to use that and how that made him feel. And see, way back in the day, prisons used to be called reformatories because they tried to reform the inmate and set them up for success so they can survive in a free environment on the outside. Needless to say, that rarely happens anymore. That, you know, they just get put in there, they do their time, and they get out. School is another thing that where you can be institutionalized. You know, I, I mean, I went to Bible college for, you know, I crammed four years into five. And, <laughs> and uh, so, 
you know, you become institutionalized. You get used to the way things are, 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 are conducted there, the way you dress, the way you talk. And I noticed that during the summer when I was out of college, it was shocking to me to hear somebody swear because I didn't hear it all year on campus. I was used to calling people sir and ma'am, which blew some people out of the water. Some people got upset. Don't call me ma'am. I'm not that old. But I was institutionalized. So institutionalization is not necessarily a bad thing in some respects. Being Going to work. You know you have a routine when you're at work. It's an institution. You become institutionalized. But it takes anywhere from two weeks to 90 days to become institutionalized to any given environment. As short as two weeks to 90 days, really depending upon somebody's will, somebody's stubbornness, somebody's constitution, so to speak. That's why when you get a job, it's a 90-day trial period. Because within 90 days, you're going to show your true colors. In 90 days, you're going to show your work ethic. In 90 days, they're going to get a good picture of what kind of an employee you're going to be. And they're going to decide, are we going to keep this guy or are we going to give him his pink slip? So that's what I mean by institutionalization. So to deprogram, to be deinstitutionalized, it's the same, the same is true. The same holds true. It takes anywhere from two weeks to 90 days to become deprogrammed or deinstitutionalized from something that you've, it basically, it's about forming habits, right? It's about habit forming. And there's good habits, there's bad habits, things like that. A nursing home is another uh, institution where people can become in institutionalized. And another good example of somebody being institutionalized is that, you know, you know, sometimes you have those doorbells that sound like a buzzer. They don't go ding dong, but they go ee. Yeah. Well, they have that noise in the prison. When a door is being unlocked or, or a gate is being unlocked, there's just like ee. And then you just hear the gate. And usually a guard comes in and says, okay, assume the position. And the guy gets up against the wall so he can be searched. Well, somebody who had just come out of prison, they hear that, they instinctually stand up and put their hands against the wall, right? Because they're institutionalized. And uh, so without structure, uh, a deinstitutionalized de individual or a group will fail and they'll often reoffend. Like I said, you'll see prisoners get put back in prison again because they don't know how to live on the outside. Um, so that's why for prisoners, uh, halfway houses and ministries like, like Harvest House are very important because it will help people who have just been released to form good habits, make good connections, get jobs, get re-educated, get trained, get a trade, you know, learn how to live and conduct and be a productive member of society. So they need that. And usually these programs, like I don't know, how long is the program at Harvest House? Uh, it's a 90 day. Not, there you go, a 90-day program, right? So three months. Because that's usually how long it takes to start forming new habits. So we see that after the exodus from Egypt, that Israel had a hard time. The children of Israel had a hard time to adjusting to their freedom. And they ended up speaking fondly about their slavery. Could you imagine? You know, when somebody's in prison, oh, man, I can't wait to get out because when I get on the outside, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I hate the food here and I hate this and that and blah, 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 blah. But when they get out, they're like, well, man, I'm scared. I'm terrified. I don't know where I'm going to get a job. I don't know where I'm going to live. I don't know, I'm gonna, I don't know what, what I'm going to do. So it was better for me in prison. So I'm going to bust a window and steal something so they'll put me back in. So we see kind of the children of Israel doing a very similar thing. When things get rough and things get tough out in the wilderness, they started reminiscing about, oh, the good old days of slavery. Oh, you remember how great it was being a slave? Well, in Exodus chapter 16, it says they journeyed on from Elim and they entered the community and the entire community of B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai. And on the 15th day of the second month after leaving the land of Egypt, so they hadn't been gone too long, right? But the whole congregation of B'nai Israel, the children of Israel murmured. I love that word, murmur, murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The children of Israel said to them, oh, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. When we sat by our pots of meat, when we ate bread until we were full, but you brought us into this wilderness to kill us, the entire congregation with hunger. 
They were used to eating at a certain time. They knew that their food was going to be provided for them by their, by their overlords, by their taskmasters. They didn't have to go hunt. They didn't have to go harvest. It may have been a, a, a pot of gruel, but hey, at least it filled your belly. And they were reminiscing about the meat pots and the bread. And because they didn't have the meat pots and the bread of slavery, and they were out in the wilderness having to fend for themselves and having to, God forbid, depend on the Lord, they were, they were actually thinking with fondness about their institutionalization. They still had that institutionalized mindset. They had that slave mentality. You know, it's like a little child. Does a little child worry about breakfast, lunch, dinner? No. Oh, do they worry about the clothes that they're going to wear when they wake up in the morning right on the foot of their bed? Their mom, their dad has laid out what they're going to wear. They come down right before they go to daycare or school, and guess what? There's a hot bowl of cereal sitting right in front of them. When they get home, they get their little fruit snack and cookies and watch their cartoons. It's, they don't worry about that. It's a given. They don't come back and say, oh, gee, I wonder if I'm going to have that fruit snack when I get home. No, they know it's a given. And so Israel knew that all these things were provided for, even though it says in, uh, um, about their slavery that they, were, that they were abused, that it was harsh labor, it was rigorous labor, things like that. They forgot about all that stuff. They were just wanting a full belly. They were just wanting to be provided for now. And in the book of Numbers, which also talks about the wanderings of, of the Israelites, in Numbers chapter 11, it says, The people were murmuring in the ears of Adonai about the hardship. And when Adonai heard, his anger burned. He got mad. Then the fire of Adonai blazed among them, ravaging the outskirts of the camp. The people cried out to Moses. So Moses prayed to Adonai and the fire died down. The name of the place was called uh, Tabira because, uh, because fire from Adonai had burned among them. The, grumble, the grumblers among them began to have cravings. So Bnei Israel began to wail repeatedly saying, Oh, if we could just eat some of the meat. We remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for free. Didn't cost us nothing. We didn't have to labor for it. It was given to us. The cucumbers. There's no cucumbers in the desert. The melons. There's no melon patches in the desert. The leeks and the onions and the garlic. The things that they couldn't have that they had in Egypt, they were craving and longing for. And God's like, wait a second, you're not appreciative of the manna and of the quail and of the water from the rock and of these things that I'm providing for you? Now, rabbinic legend says that this manna pretty much tasted like whatever they wanted it to taste like. I mean, we say, we read in the scripture that it, that it, that it was like a wafer and it tasted like honey and it was sweet. But the rabbis say that if they wanted it to taste like something, they could have it taste like a melon or a leek or a cucumber. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's rabbinic legend. But if that's so, they could have had what they wanted, what they were craving. But they weren't appreciative because they were so locked into this slave mentality. They were so locked into this institutionalization. And it took longer than two weeks to 90 days for the children of Israel to be deinstitutionalized. Why? Because they were particularly stiff-necked. They were particularly stubborn. Because during this whole time, they tried to work out their own institutions. They tried to do things on their own. You had the incident with the golden calf and all this kind of stuff that happened during that time before God showed up at Mount Sinai and gave them a new institution and gave them his laws and gave him his commandments and gave them his instructions. So, you know, why, why were they grumbling and looking so fondly upon their slave years? Because slavery is predictable. Freedom is not. Slavery is predictable. You wake up, you know exactly how things are going to go. You're a slave. You have no will, no freedom of your own. You know how, the, how it's written. Freedom is not predictable. You don't know what you're going to do or where you're going to go next or what's going to happen to you next. And to some people, that terrifies them. That's a scary thing. So Israel was institutionalized to slavery in Egypt. We are institutionalized to the slavery of sin. Don't tell me you didn't enjoy sinning. Sinning's fun. You get your kicks and you get your jollies out of sin, right? But as the scripture says, it's only for a short season. 
It kind of rem- sin reminds me of a roller coaster ride. You you uh, you wait in line for three hours to ride this new ride everybody's talking about, and the ride lasts for sixty seconds, and it's over. You waited three hours in line for a sixty second thrill, maybe a ninety second thrill at most. Three three you know ninety seconds compared to three hours. I mean, come on. But there's a there's a group called Lust Control, and they sung a song called "Going to Hell is a Fun Fun Feeling," and it's true. So, you know, don't tell me that you weren't institutionalized to your slavery to sin. You, you loved your sin. If we can only serve God as much as we served our sin, how things would be different. You know, we loved our drugs. We loved our lying. We loved our gossip. We loved our cheating and stealing. We loved our hustling. We loved all these things. Yeah, sure, we had our little guilty moments and moments of, of regret. But when we got high or did it again, all that, we forgot about that. It went away because it was fun. And then... You didn't have really any hardships in your life of sin. The hardships that you had, you were used to because you thought, oh, this is just the way things are. But when you got saved and you were delivered from that sin, then you started getting persecuted because you weren't sinning. The devil started attacking you because you weren't sinning. And you're like, well, gee, you know, I, I never had it this hard when I was living out in the world. And then you start double thinking and questioning your life in Christ. Oh, this is what freedom is all about. I don't want that. I don't want this freedom. It's like Cypher from The Matrix. Oh, yeah, I know that this is a fake world, but I can't take this real life. I can't take this freedom. Put Plug me back into The Matrix. I know it's all fake. I know it's not going to last. Just plug me back in, though. It's kind of the same thing. So a little hardship or persecution in slavery to sin, whatever hardships we do uh, uh, or, or that happen to us, we're hardened and we're used to them, and we look at that as normal living. And so I want to read a passage in Romans, Romans chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. Do you not know that whatever you yield yourself as slaves for obedience, you are slaves to what you obey, whether to sin resulting in death or to obedience resulting in righteousness? Now, where does Paul get that from? Where does Paul get, you know, uh, obedience to righteousness equals life and obedience or disobedience to to God equals death? Where does he get that from? He gets that from Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28 outlines all the blessings that will tackle you and overtake you and fall upon you when you obey God, when you keep his commandments. And why do we keep the commandments? So we can stay, so, so we can be saved or stay saved? No, because it's not works, right? No. I mean, we don't have to earn our salvation. So why then do we keep God's law? Why do we keep his commandments? Why do we keep his instructions? Huh? Because you love him and because you are saved. That's why. So he says here, I'll read it again. Do you not know that whatever you yield yourself to as slaves for obedience, you are slaves to what you obey? Whether to sin resulting in death, because the curse of sin is death. And what did Jesus do? What was nailed to the cross? Not the law. The penalty of the law was nailed to the cross. What's the penalty of the law? Death. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Okay, so then that makes us question, well, what is sin? 1 John 3, 4 gives us the definition of sin. The definition of sin is breaking God's law. Lawlessness. That's the definition of sin. Whether to sin resulting in death or to obedience resulting in righteousness. And what did Yeshua say? He says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And and even in the Old Testament, it says, Moses told the children of Israel, these commandments are not burdensome. So where are we getting all this burden from? Obeying the Lord. And was Jesus' commandments, Yeshua's commandments, any different from the Father's? No. He says, I and, the, I and the Father are one. I don't do anything except for what the Father tells me to do. I do exactly what he says. And so when Yeshua says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, two things are implied there. That Yeshua didn't come up with any new commandments. He just elaborated on the commandments that are already there. He kind of explained them further, if you will. He kind of showed the disciples really rightly how to obey God's word. But he is also referring back to his father's commandments. Because he didn't come here and say, okay, I'm going to just do undo everything my father did, and I'm going to give you something totally different, so, totally something new. No. 
That's not what happened. So whether to sin resulting in death or to obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that through you, but though you were slaves of sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teachings under which you were placed. And after you were set free from sin, you became enslaved to righteousness. You've been enslaved to righteousness. Kind of sounds like an oxymoron, but being enslaved to righteousness means you're free. You're free not to sin now. Why do you keep all these rules and such a goody-goody? Because I'm not a slave anymore. Well, isn't that hard to do? Well, no, not really, because I love my God, and I'm going to do what he says. I'm going to keep his commandments. I do it because I, you know, why, why am I, why do I stay fidelis with my wife? Why don't I go around running around and, you know, chase another tail? Because I love my wife. Is that a burden or hard for me to do? No. No, it shouldn't be, and it isn't. So our, our relationship with God is likened to a marriage. We're even called the bride of Christ. And if we love him, we're going to keep his commandments, which are nothing more than wedding vows. We're going to keep our vows to him. And so that's where the freedom is, is that I'm free not to sin. I can. I have that choice, but I choose not to. So my choice is freedom, and that freedom keeps me from being enslaved to sin. So number back to Numbers. Numbers chapter 10, verse 11. It says, On the 20th day of the second month of the second year, the cloud lifted up from above the tabernacle of the testimony. So they were at Sinai for a long time. Even they were, they were there for a while after God showed up on Sinai and gave them the tablets, the Ten Commandments. They were there for a long time. So it took them longer than 90 days to deinstitutionalize themselves, right? Because they were stubborn and they were stiff-necked. Um, all right, so I'm going to go to Exodus chapter 19. So this is what happened at Sinai. This is when this new institution, the old institution of slavery was done away with. The old institution of Egypt was being left behind and was being shed. And God was giving them a new institution. Because when a prisoner is released from prison, like I said, if he doesn't have guidance and if he doesn't have structure, he's going to reoffend and end up back in prison again. How does he keep from doing that? By getting involved in a halfway house or some kind of program, some kind of training or whatever. I know some people who don't do good with personal freedom. They like being told what to do. I have a nephew that lived a lot. He just got in trouble all the time. And he tried so hard to do the right thing, but he always ended up doing the wrong thing. What was his solution? He went into the military. And he is doing great because he, he, he has structure. He didn't have structure before. He couldn't create his own structure. Nobody could make structure for him. But when he went into the military, it's like that solved a lot of his problems. So here is this new institution that the Lord uh, uh, institutes, if you will, uh, here in, um, uh, in Exodus chapters 19 and 20. It says, in the third month, after B'nai Israel, the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt the third month. That's 90 days. In the third month, after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, that same day they arrived in the wilderness of Sinai. They traveled from Rephidim. Rephidim means dead ones. It actually kind of infers that it was a land of ghosts, a land of demonic spirits. They traveled from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai and set up camp in the wilderness. Israel camped there right in front of the mountain. And this mountain was the mountain that God told Moses, you're going to know that I'm the one who told you to go to Egypt and to deliver the children of Israel because I'm going to bring you back here. When, I, when you come back here, you're going to know that everything I said was true. So it says, Moses went up to God and Adonai called to him from the mountain saying, say this to the house of Jacob, tell B'nai Israel, tell the children of Israel, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians. And how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you listen closely to my voice and keep all my and keep my covenant, then you will be my own treasure from among all peoples, 
from all for all the earth is mine. So as for you, you will be my kingdom of Kohanim, my kingdom of priests, a holy nation. And holy is a big religious fancy word that just means set apart for a specific purpose, set apart for a unique purpose. These are the words which you are to speak to the children of Israel. So Moses went and called the elders of the people and put before them all these words that Adonai had commanded them, him. All the people answered together, everything that Adonai has spoken, we will do. You know what the rabbis say about this verse? The rabbis say this is when Israel married God. God said, will you? And Israel said, I do. But guess who else said I do? The mixed multitude that went out with them. They were standing there at the foot of Mount Sinai when the law was given. Don't be deceived in thinking that the law is only for the Jews, only for the children of Israel, the 12 tribes, because the mixed multitude was there and they accepted upon themselves God's laws, God's instructions, just as the children of Israel did. And God said many times throughout the five books of Moses, the same law will be for you and for the sojourner among you. For you and the foreigner among you. God didn't play favorites and make one set of rules for one people and one set of rules for another people. We all get the same rules. And so, um, so Moses went and called the elders of the people of Israel and put before them all the words that Adonai had commanded him. And the people, of, uh, people answered together and said, everything that Adonai has spoken, we will do. Then Moses reported the words of the people to Adonai. And Adonai said to Moses, I am about to come to you in a thick cloud. Now, get this. They said yes before they really heard everything that Adonai expected. They said I do before they really knew everything that God wanted. And that says a lot right there. So Adonai said to Moses, I'm about to come to you in a thick cloud so that the people will hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. Then Moses told the words of the people to Adonai. And Adonai said to Moses, go to the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothing and be ready for the third day. For on the third day, Adonai will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You are to set boundaries for the people around saying, be careful, do not go onto the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain will surely be put to death. Not a hand is to touch it, but he will surely be stoned or shot through. Uh, whether it is an animal or a man, it will not live. When the shofar, that is the ram's horn, the trumpet, sounds, they may come up to the mountain. Then Moses went down from the mountain to the people, consecrated them, and then they washed their clothing. He said to the people, be ready for the third day. Uh, do not draw near to your wives. And in the morning on the third day, there was thundering. You know what this word in Hebrew is, thundering? They were voices. Voices. So the word could be translated voices or thunderings. And the rabbis say that this word thunderings or this word voices meant that everybody that was camping with the children of Israel heard God in their own language. Voices, plural. They heard in Hebrew. They heard in whatever other languages were spoken at that time, whatever the mixed multitude was speaking. They heard a bingo, just like Pentecost, because this is the origin of Pentecost. The same things that happened at Pentecost or the same thing that happened at Shavuot uh, here in Exodus 19 happened in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. These signs were repeated to let Israel know this is what's happening. So, yeah, there in the morning on the third day, there was thunderings or there was voices and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and the blast of an exceeding shofar. What, is sho what does a shofar produce? A shofar produces a mighty wind. Doesn't it say in Acts chapter 2 that there was a, the, a voice of a mighty wind, a roaring of a mighty wind? So you had the voices, you had the people understanding in their own languages, you had the mighty wind, and all the people in the camp trembled. Uh, then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the lowest part of the mountain. Uh, now the entire Mount Sinai was in smoke because Adonai had descended upon it in fire. Oh, where else did God descend in fire on? Acts chapter 2 on the heads of the believers. Yeah, cloven tongues of fire. All the signs are there. Pentecost is not some new holiday or new observance or new thing that happened in Acts chapter 2. It happened and originated 
here in Exodus chapter 19 is repeated in Leviticus chapter 23. The smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the sound of the shofar grew louder and louder, now here's a little thing. Where did the shofar come from? Who was blowing the shofar? The rabbis say that this shofar come from the ram that was sacrificed by Abraham, the ram that took Isaac's place, that this ram was caught in the thicket by its horns, but its horns were irregular. There was a smaller shofar or a smaller horn and a larger horn. Abraham took the smaller horn for himself and God took the larger one for himself. And that's where it's said that this belief that this shofar came from and that the shofar that God was blowing. When the sound of the shofar grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him with thunderous sound. Then Adonai came down onto Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. I mean, God did not come down in, until this time. He hadn't come down like that and, except for in Genesis with Adam and Eve. Walking with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. It's as if God was resetting things, trying to say, we're going to go back to an Edenic state. So he showed up to Adam and Eve and walked with them in the cool of the day. And he came down here on Mount Sinai and showed himself to the people of Israel. Then Adonai came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. Adonai called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up. Then Adonai spoke to Moses, go down and warn the people lest they break through to see Adonai. And many of them die. Even the Kohanim, the priest, who come near to Adonai must consecrate themselves so that Adonai does not break out against them. Moses said to Adonai, uh, the people cannot come up to the Mount Sinai, for you are the one who warned us, saying, set boundaries about the mountain and consecrate it. Then Adonai said to him, go down. You are to come back up and you and Aaron with you, but do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to Adonai. And he will or he will break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them in Exodus chapter 20. Then God spoke all these words. I am Adonai, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You are to have no other gods before me. So this word before you shall have no other gods before me. It also means you are not to have any other gods alongside me. Not only are you to put any other gods before me, you're not to have any gods beside me. I don't have a consort. All these pagan religions had a male and female god, and they were consorts of each other, right? So it's like, there is no other. There's just me. You are to have no other gods before me. Do not make for yourself a graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or on the earth below, or in the water under the earth. Do not bow down to them. Do not... Uh, let anyone make you serve them, for I am Adonai your God, am a jealous God, bringing the iniquity or lawlessness of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands of generations of those who love me and keep my mitzvot, who keep my commandments. You must not take the name of Adonai your God in vain, for Adonai will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. Remember Yom Shabbat, or the day of the Sabbath, the Sabbath day, to keep it holy, to keep it set apart, to keep it separate, separated, sacred. You are to work six days and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to Adonai your God. In it you are not to do any work, not you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, your cattle, nor the outsiders that is within your gates. Let me stop right there and give you, tell you a little pet peeve of mine. Okay, you know that I observe today, Saturday, is my Sabbath because God said that's the Sabbath day. It's always has been, always will be. But Christians rest on, on Sunday, right? What has bothered me is that why do these pe do people go to church? Like, oh, oh, let's go to Haley's or let's go out to dinner. What does it say here? You are not to do any work, New, you nor your sons nor your daughters nor your male servants nor your female servants. You're making somebody work on what you consider the Sabbath. You're breaking the Sabbath by going out to eat. You're, you're conducting business, exchanging money. You're, key, you're like, well, they're going to work anyway. Well, who, who cares if they're going to work anyway? Don't make them work. You shouldn't be the excuse why they work. Because maybe they would go to church if the Christians didn't show up for lunch. <laughs> maybe they would. It's a pet peeve of mine. <laughs> even, even when I was in Bible college, I didn't like to go out to eat on Sunday and people going out to eat. I'd just rather eat in the cafeteria at school. Because it's like, 
what, what, what don't you get about the Sabbath day? Now, I'm not saying anybody's going to go to hell for doing this, but you're keeping somebody else from possibly attending church, from possibly getting to know the Lord. And let me tell you, if you've talked to any waitresses, they're going to say they dread Sundays because the Christians are usually the nastiest and the cheapskates. They don't tip well. And there's always something wrong with the service or the food. That's a bad witness. That's a bad witness. And you know what? I get people's I get people's reasoning, you know, that they put a dollar on the table in a tract. You know, those tracts that look like dollar bills and they think they're getting a big tip and they're like, oh, stupid cheapskate. That's not a good witness. If you're gonna give a if you're gonna give a tract, give a really good tip with that tract. They'll be more apt to read that tract with a good tip. Okay, I'm gonna get off my soapbox here. <laughs> But the seventh day is a Sabbath to Adonai your God. In it you shall not do any work, not you, nor your son, nor your daughters, nor your male servants, nor your female servants, nor your cattle, nor the outsider that is within your gates. My pet peeve does not just extend to Christians, but to Jews as well. Orthodox Jews will get what is called a Shabbos Goy, which means a Gentile that goes in on the Sabbath day to turn the lights on for him in the synagogue. Yeah. I'm thinking, that's a little hypocritical. Yes. And they, they get them to turn the lights on for them because they will not kindle a fire on the Sabbath. I'm sorry, but turning on a light switch is not kindling a fire. I don't care what you say. Kindling a fire is going out into the field, chopping down a tree, splitting the wood, carrying the wood, making kindling, rubbing two sticks together or, or a flint and making a fire. Boy, that'll break a sweat. That's work. You're laboring. You're laboring. Turning on a light switch is nothing. A light switch is a gate. Whether you touch that light switch or not, that electricity is always flowing. That fire, if you will, is always burning. You're just controlling a gate. If that's the case, then don't open a door on Sabbath because you're working. You're opening a door. That's all a light switch is, is a gate. I'm probably going to make a lot of people mad who's listening to this. <laughs> Uh, okay, for in six days Adonai made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. And Adonai blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long upon the land which Adonai your God is giving you. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Do not covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, his manservant or his maidservant, his ox, donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. All the people witnessed the thunderings and the lightnings and the sound of the shofar and the mountain smoking. And when people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. So they said to Moses, uh, you speak to us and we will listen, but don't let God speak to us or we'll die. So Moses said to the people, don't be afraid for God has come to test you so that you may fear, uh, so, so that his fear may be in you so that you do not sin. Having a fear of God keeps us from sinning which is a good thing. So sometimes fear is good. You know, I have a fear of heights, not, I mean, really high heights. And that's a good fear because it keeps me from falling over the edge and killing myself. <laughs> so a fear of heights isn't a bad thing. So fear of God is not a bad thing because it keeps you from sin. Uh, okay, um, the people, okay, da, 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 da. all right. Then Moses said, to, uh, then Adonai said to Moses, say to the children of Israel, you yourselves have seen that I've spoken to you from heaven. Do not make gods of silver alongside me and do not make gods of gold for yourselves. You are to make an altar of earth for me. You will sacrifice your burnt offerings, your fellowship offerings, your sheep, your cattle uh, in every place where I cause my name to be mentioned. I will put, I will come to you and bless you. Okay, so the tabernacle was that place. After when the tabernacle was constructed, that was the only legitimate place people could sacrifice to the Lord. No more personal altars, no more high places. And when the tabernacle was put, you know, packed up and put away and Solomon built the temple, in Solomon's prayer, he made a covenant to God saying, this is the only legitimate place to sacrifice. So again, no more personal altars and all these things like that. When you, when you make for me an altar of stone, do not build it from cut stone, for if you use a tool on it, you will profane it, because using a tool on it is a symbol of war. Iron, swords, you know, he, God wants things to be natural. Nor are you to go up to my altar on steps so that your nakedness uh, would not be uncovered while on it. So people can't peek up your little 
robe while you're up on the steps. They can't peek up your robe if you're on a ramp. So there was a ramp. Anyway, so that was Exodus chapter 19 and 20. This was the new institution to replace the old institution of slavery. And we see after that there were still problems, but it wasn't as bad because when the tabernacle was built, that was the first time since slavery that the children of Israel had a purpose. They all unified. They were all unified to keep themselves alive so that they wouldn't die in slavery, so they were slaves. But then it come to the point where they were free and they didn't know what to do with themselves. And God said, I'll give you something to do. You know, can I remember your parents? Like, I, I'm bored. Oh, I'll give you something to do. No, that's okay. I already found something, Mom. So God gave them something to do to build a tabernacle. Why? So that God could dwell among them. Because God wanted to be with his people. And so that's when they unified. And that's when there was no bickering, no fighting, no arguing. During that whole time, the tabernacle was built. And after that, they kind of got in the habit of this new institution and they became a holy people. And again, that's not to say that there wasn't any problems after that. Obviously, there was. But that was their, that was their beyond 90-day period where they broke off from slavery and, and went into a new institution, a new way of living. And that new way of living is still the way of life that Jewish people live today. You will see no more dedicated people than the, than the Orthodox Jewish people in keeping God's commandments. They are stricter than strict. They even add more commandments upon the commandments that are already there to make sure that they don't break the original commandments. That's how serious they are about, the, about their institution because they love God and they want to stay close to God. So institutions and Passover, we've got to get away from our institution of slavery to sin and get used to our freedom in Christ. And I'll tell you that freedom in Christ that Holy Spirit freedom, the Holy Spirit's not going to tell you to do something that the scripture forbids. You have people acting stupid in church, sometimes even throwing off their clothes and say, oh, I was drunk in the spirit. No, you weren't. You were drunk with the spirit, but it wasn't the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit wouldn't tell you to do that and act a fool. Holy Spirit would keep you modest. You know, so the Lord's not going, the freedom of the Lord doesn't, isn't a license to sin. And the freedom of the Lord is the Lord is not going to tell you to do something that he forbids. And that's one thing that we got to remember. So, you know, there's a lot of people and I'm not knocking the charismatic movement because I believe in the move of the Holy Spirit. I believe in the gifts of the spirit. I believe in the uh, the, the fivefold ministry in the offices. But at the same time, I don't believe in this, you know, roaring like a lion and moon like a cow and running around in church. Yeah. You know, the exact same thing happens in India. It's called the Kundalini spirit. Where people will slither on the ground like a snake and move like a cow and roar like a lion and all this kind of stuff. They're doing this in churches now and saying it's of the Holy Spirit and of the Lord. It's of a spirit, but not of the Holy Spirit. I can tell you that. I don't see any evidence in the scripture where the believers were drunk in the spirit and they started barking like dogs. It just didn't happen. It's not there. So don't try. To... Anyway, boy, I'm going on a lot of bunny trails today. All right. Uh, good bunny trails. All right. Let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Lord God, I pray, Lord, that you would just instill within us a desire, a fervor, an excitement about you and about your word. That we wouldn't just be believers in name only, but our deeds would prove our declarations of faith. Just as James says, faith without works is dead. We don't want to have a dead faith. We don't want to be dead believers, zombie believers. We want to be living believers. We want to be doing believers, not just saying believers, but doing believers. Because talk is cheap and actions speak louder than words. Lord, I pray that you would help us as we deprogram ourselves and deinstitutionalize ourselves from our former life of sin and from our fallen nature. It takes a lifetime to do, and it comes in degrees and it comes in levels and layers. But Lord, Help us to be patient with ourselves. Sometimes we want us to we want ourselves to grow faster than we need to. Kind of like when we're little kids and you know we're we're a little kid and we want to be a teenager. When we're a teenager, we want to be an adult. When we're an adult, we want to be a kid again. <laughs> so Lord, I just pray, God, that you would just help us to enjoy the journey. Enjoy the place that you have us. Just as Paul said, I've learned that in whatever situation, I've learned to be content. Even in trouble, trial, and tribulation, help us to learn to be content because we know that that trouble, trial, tribulation produces perseverance, produces patience, produces endurance. And it forges us and makes us more like your son. 
And that's, that's the whole goal, is to be conformed into the image of Messiah Yeshua, to have the mind of Christ. So Lord, help us to deinstitutionalize ourselves from our past life, from our life of slavery to sin, and be institutionalized in your word. That it wouldn't just be a book that we read, it just wouldn't be customs and traditions and rituals that we do and hoops we jump through, but it would be something that would be second nature, a part of our lives, something that we can't live without, something that brings us contentment and meaning and purpose and fulfillment, something that others can see and say, man, I want what that person has because our witness has been tainted, has been sullied. In these last several generations, as we've seen the watering down of the church, we want to be on fire for you. We don't want you to spit us out of your mouth. We want to be hot, Lord. So we ask and pray these things in Yeshua's name. Amen.